Hello and welcome to my channel. Bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and this evening I will be doing a shorter review for The Forgotten Beasts of Eld by Patricia A. McKillop. I say shorter because as you can see this book isn't very long and I wasn't sure I was going to do a review for it but I was actually really surprised by how much I enjoyed it. It's really lovely warm story to which I gave four stars on Goodreads so I thought it was worthwhile to do a little review for it. It's also my first entry into the world of the Fantasy Masterworks collection. As you can see I already have a nice little accumulation of science fiction masterworks editions. I also want to delve into the Fantasy Masterworks. So what is this little book about? Very briefly it is the story of Sibel a witch. I mean she's called a wizard. I think they make a distinction between wizards and witches. Witches being more like the hedge witch in her little hut gathering herbs. Wizards being more interested in like the stars, high magic etc. So she's more of a female wizard. She was raised by her father in near total isolation on the mountain of Eld, surrounded by mythical beasts of legend, including a swan, a bull, a lion, a cat, a dragon, and a falcon. And one day when she's 16 years old, a young man comes to her and brings her an infant named Tamlorn, and she's told that this little boy is the heir to a kingdom at war with the kingdom of this young man and they're trying to smuggle him out of the realm of men to play, you know, politics and things like that. And so she's asked to raise this little boy. I won't say more because I really don't want to spoil this. It's very short, like I said, but that's the basic premise. One of the things I found really nice about this novel is the writing style. I would qualify it as subtly, quietly, elegant and lyrical. There's something very gently poetic about it. There's some beautiful descriptions and there's this magical, obviously almost mythical atmosphere to the story, like it's surrounded by the mists of time and of legend, etc. A feeling which I've had with The Lord of the Rings, with the Earth Sea Cycle as well, which isn't always necessarily the best thing either, but here it worked. And I was reminded both of The Mists of Avalon and, like I just mentioned, The Earth Sea Cycle by Ursula Kilgwin. So a great combination of evocations, I think. It is a straightforward story. It starts off with a preliminary chapter which sets the scene, the story's context, traces Sibel's origins, her lineage, how she came to be surrounded by these fantastical beasts, and ends with her receiving Tamlorn into her care. And then the story picks up about 13, 14 years later when he's a young teen and the story goes forward from there. This is fantasy, I mean obviously fantasy mass works. The type of fantasy I would assign to this is I guess mythical fantasy. I'm not even sure that's an official like subgenre a fantasy, but it's something in the vein of, well I mean Tolkien is heroic fantasy, but there's something of the Tolkien verse. So it's I guess more similar in tone to the earthly cycle. There's something very quiet about it. But definitely going forward, I mean there is a bit of action, but yeah, mythical fantasy, just take it or leave it. And it's also a story, fundamentally I think, about self-knowledge and self-acceptance of growth and acquiring maturity, especially since Sibel was raised outside of the realm of ordinary people, but then she goes into that realm for the sake of the little boy, or in conjunction to her raising that young boy Tamlorn, and she learns in a way to become more human, or just to be herself, but in harmony with the people around her. I'll leave it at that. Character-wise, we'll stick to a group, a call, of four or five characters. Obviously the main character is Sibel, like I said. At first glance you would think Sibel is like an archetype of the Enchantress, but that's not quite right because she doesn't seduce anyone, or at least not voluntarily. She's a mixture between the Enchantress and like the wizard in his ivory tower. In this case the wizard in the ivory tower is female. There's something very distant about her, almost cold, and she's described as cold, beautifully cold, like an ice crystal several times. But there's also something very wise about her, very calm, collected, 
patient. She's interested in gathering knowledge and calling fantastical beasts to her and studying their names and summoning them. She has no care for the troubles, the toils of ordinary men and women. But then at the same time, she learns to care for this little baby Tamlorn. She has a relationship with the local hedge witch called Melga. And then she develops feelings for a certain man in the story. There's a real character arc of personal growth in the story. Sibel gains in emotional maturity, but also an intellectual maturity in a, in a way because she's tempted by the darker passions of the human heart. That's the thing, she's isolated on her mountain with her animals, but then she discovers love for another human being, and she discovers hatred for another human being. So she really grows as a woman, and I enjoyed reading about that. The only quibble I have with the way her emotional life is described is that there's no acknowledgement that what she feels for her animals is love. Love is only evoked once humans, I mean other humans, enter the picture. And that rubbed me the wrong way, because I just can't believe that you live with these animals day in, day out, for years upon years. You feed them, communicate telepathically with them, you share riddles and experiences with them. You don't feel love or attachment. Come on, I don't buy that for a single second. What she had with those animals was love. Maybe not the love shared between human beings. That's perfectly fine. I, I agree with that. I mean, the author did want to give her this character growth arc involving other human beings. I understand that. But I don't think, you know, it's not mutually exclusive to learn to love other human beings and still acknowledge you have deep attachment to your animal companions, just saying. Another character, of course, is Tamlon. Tamlon, very simply, is kind of an Arthur figure. He's a young, earnest, genuine man. Well, I mean, a young boy, then a young man, who wants to learn about his lineage, his father, who loves Sibel deeply, and he's generous and kind and caring. Perhaps even a little more generous and positive than the traditional Arthur figure. I mean, you can tell he's going to be a good king someday. And then you have Corin, which is the man who brings Tamlorn to Sibel and becomes a very important character in the story. And he's also very positive, generous of heart and spirit, but he also harbors deep resentment and hatred towards his family's enemy, the king of the neighboring country, who is the father of Tamil, King Dreed, because Dreed is responsible for Corin's brother's death. So he has a lot of resentment and bitterness in his heart. But at the same time, he's also very wise. He has an affinity for all things magical and mystical. He knows about all these legends and stories. And when he encounters Sibel's animals, he recognizes them immediately. And there's something really nice and uh, authentic about him. And you have King Dreed, like I said. He's basically the figure of the bitter, resentful king who lost his wife to another man's love and is now racked with paranoia and fear of losing what he has, etc. Bit of a, again, archetypal stock character. And finally, we have Melga, and Melga, like I said, is a hedge witch who acts as Sibel's adoptive mother. And she's, again, they're a bit, you know, stock characters, like I said. She's this wise old cronish woman with her potions and also her familiars. She has doves and a raven. And she's full of very practical, down-to-earth knowledge of the world, of other humans, and she comforts Sibel. She just accepts her as she is. She listens to her, looks after her, is worried about her when Sibel starts taking a darker turn. World-building-wise, there's honestly not that much to say. There's not much law involved. There's just a basic description of the realm of Eld, called Eldworld, and moors and swamps, and you've got Eld Mountain, where Sibel grew up, and these various little kingdoms warring with one another, and these vast deserts or ice fields where all these fantastical legendary creatures came from. But that's about it. You do have a bit of background info for each animal how they lived before they came to Sibel, or her father, or her grandfather, but that's about it. And even though this is primarily a story of self-discovery and self-acceptance in the end, especially for Sibel, but also in a certain way for Corin, even for Tamlorn to a lesser extent, I do think there are a couple of themes gently, comfortably floating around in there, such as the theme of power. How power obviously can corrupt someone's heart, soul, what people will do to gain power, how people exert power over others, sometimes perhaps unknowingly, 
not realizing that that's what you're doing, how people in power then fear of losing it, become paranoid because of it. What prices are you willing to pay to gain power, to retain power? Those are all questions floating around in there. Then you have the theme, or like I said, the main story structure of the book, which is self-growth and acquiring maturity on an emotional and or intellectual level. This especially applies to Sibel, once again. Or the theme of freedom. The freedom to be oneself, the freedom to love, the freedom perhaps to let go of things as well, because that's actually quite difficult to do. And there is a focus on Sibel's inner emotional life, and the story looks at how she deals with these newfound human passions of love, hatred, bitterness, anger, etc. And she doesn't feel free to let go of those things. So I think that's a theme. Freedom, but perhaps especially freedom, like I said, to be yourself, to live your truth, but also to let go of negative feelings and toxic emotions. And that's directly linked to the final sub-theme, I would say, which is what is the cost of living with others? It's directly linked because on the one hand, you can choose to be free to be yourself 100%, but that rarely works with living with other human beings, which might have conflicting passions, interests, goals, etc. Sibel is a couple of times confronted with the option of either going back to her mountain and her beautiful home she has there, or to live with other human beings. What will she have to sacrifice to make that work? What will she gain? if she chooses to make that sacrifice, because she'll get something in return for it as well. She won't be as alone, she'll have other minds with which to exchange things, etc. So maybe beyond the theme of freedom, it's the theme of balance between the individual and the community. And that includes her animals as well, and that also links back to the theme of power, because she does have a hold on these beasts. As a wizard, she has the power to summon them and retain them in her company. But so. How does that impact her relationship with those animals? Is it really a genuine relationship if she's holding them against their will? I mean, they don't complain about it. They accept to be in her service and they're fiercely loyal to her. And I would say love her in their own non-human ways. But it's not an entirely equal relationship either. I mean, they respect her. She's a wizard. So I guess they accept in a way to submit to her. But still, she holds them. What kind of implications does that have? All these things are in there. It doesn't go that deeply into any one of the themes I just mentioned, but they're there, so it does make you think a little bit. I could see it, I could feel it, but beyond that, I just thought it was, there was something very warm and lovely about it. The ending really brought it together for me. It even raised my final rating, because there was something actually quite profound about the ending, I thought. So even though it's not that deep, there's still something to it, something very valuable, I think. And I definitely intend on checking out other books by this author, especially since there are several of them in the Fantasy Master Week collection. And I think all of them, or at least most of them, are standalone fantasy novels, and I'm very much interested in that. And of course, I wrote down some quotes from this lovely little novel, and I shall now share them with you. Then he looked back at her, his eyes the colour of clear mountain water. But one day you will find out how good it is to have someone who chooses to come when you call. I do, but his voice softened. A little afraid smile came into his eyes like moving water behind a film of ice. I am always a little afraid of those I have even that much power over. You are powerful and beautiful as a rich line of poetry from an ancient jewel-bound book. You cannot ever be certain of those you love, that they will not hurt you, even loving you. But to make me certain to love you will be to take away any love I might give you freely. The land was black beneath them, before faint specks of light that here and there flamed in the second plane of stars. The winds dropped past Mondor, quieted, until they melted through a silence, a cool blue-black night that was the motionless night of dreams, dimensionless, star-touched, eternal. You can fly from me, high as you choose into your darkness, but you will see me always beneath you, no matter how far away with my face turned to you. My heart is in your heart. It becomes a great, twisted thing of dark leaves and thick, winding vines that chokes and withers whatever good things grow in your heart. You can weave your life so long, only so long, and then a thing in the world out of your control will tug at one vital thread and leave you patternless and subdued. 
And that concludes my review for The Forgotten Beasts of Eld by Patricia A. McKillop. As always, I hope you found it of interest, and I certainly hope you're all doing well. I wish you all a lovely day or evening, and I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye.